stand in honor of the reading of Scripture. We're going to look in Mark chapter 3, if you'll open to Mark chapter 3. And I want to read verses 7 on down to verse 11 with you this morning as we honor God's word in the reading of Scripture. Mark chapter 3, verse 7. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea. And a great multitude followed, uh, a great multitude, excuse me, from Galilee followed him and from Judea and from Jerusalem and from Idumea and from beyond Jordan. And they were about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they had heard what great things he did, came unto him. And he spake to his disciples in a small ship that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude, lest they should, be, they should throng him. For he had healed many, insomuch that they pressed upon him, for to touch him, as many as had plagues. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. Let's bow for prayer together. Father, I thank you for your word, that we have the living word of God, the inspired word of God. And I pray that as we look at it today, that we would see the beauty of Christ. And so help me, Lord, to make that clear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. This morning, I want to talk about the title of the sermon is Five Decisions About Jesus. Five Decisions About Jesus. According to Columbia researcher, Sheehan Egard, he found that the average person makes about 70 decisions every day. 70 decisions a day. That's about 25,500 decisions a year. And over 70 years, you'll make 1,788,500 decisions. Think about that. In a very real sense, the sum total of our life is really the decisions that we make. And so, and almost everything that we do each day, our life is made up of decisions. Have you ever stopped to think that the decisions you make today can determine your destiny? And that's especially true about your eternal destiny. Now, one thing that the Bible calls upon us to do often is to make our decision. In fact, here in the Gospel of Mark, what you'll see Mark do often is he will kind of force the reader to say, what is your decision? He will present the evidence about the life of Jesus and then kind of leave an implied idea of what decision will you make about him? Don't put off your decision about Jesus. Now, in the very beginning of the Gospel of Mark, he already made one declaration. That was Jesus was the Son of God. In fact, go back to Mark chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So at the very beginning of the Gospel, Mark asserts that Jesus is the Son of God. And then he goes throughout his Gospel to show all the things that Jesus did that support that one idea. Even though he came across as an ordinary man, he wasn't an ordinary man. He was the Son of God. Don't let the sandals fool you. And so Mark here in chapter 3 is going to kind of present to us really just some decisions that people made about Jesus. Now what we see here is that multitudes follow him. We saw this in verse 7. Look again in verse 7. But Jesus withdrew himself and his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him and from Judea. If you look down in verse 20 again, and the multitude cometh together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. There were so many people thronging around Jesus, trying to touch him, that the Bible says they couldn't even eat at certain points. In verse 32, the same thing. And the multitude sat about him. So now there were multitudes of people that were following Jesus. They heard of all the great things that he had done, and they were following him. But now is the time for the people to make a decision. They were, had to make a personal decision about Jesus. Who was he? And by the way, you and I have to do the same thing. We have to decide, who is Jesus to you? What decision would you make? And what I want you to see here in chapter 3 are five decisions that people came to about Jesus. Some of these, most of these decisions are not good ones. There is a good one here, but most of them are not good ones. And here's the first one. Here's the first decision. Number one, if you're taking notes, he is a lawbreaker. That's what some people thought. And we see this in chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. And we won't go over this again because we already dealt with these verses But you might remember that Jesus went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and there was a man there with a withered hand, 
And tradition tells us that this man was a stonemason, so he would need his hand to make a living. So perhaps this man was unable to work because of his physical condition. And when Jesus saw him there in the synagogue, uh, he healed him, the Bible says. Now, you remember that the Pharisees were there in the synagogue, and they got angry at Jesus because he healed this man on the Sabbath. That was a violation of their Sabbath laws. And it's very ironic that they had laws where if you had an animal that fell into a ditch on the Sabbath day, you could certainly save the life of your animal, but you couldn't heal and save a person's life on the Sabbath. That's pretty irrational, isn't it? I read on the uh, internet this week where um, bacteria on Mars has been found, and that's considered to be life on Mars. And so someone wrote, why is bacteria on Mars considered life, but on Earth the heartbeat of an unborn baby is not? Kind of irrational. And and the the Pharisees, they could save the life of their animal on the Sabbath, but they couldn't save a man's life. And this was not the Word of God. And Jesus ignored those foolish and ridiculous traditions and healed this man. And you know what they said about him? They said he's a lawbreaker. So look in chapter 3, verse 6. And the Pharisees went forth straightway and took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might, what, destroy him. And so from there on out, they just wanted to destroy him because he was a lawbreaker. That was their decision. They couldn't have been more wrong. Jesus was not a lawbreaker. In fact, he was the only person ever to fulfill all of God's law perfectly. He was the sinless son of God. We say that a person is not saved by works. But let me just tell you something. You know what? You are saved by works. Don't kick me out of the church. You're, not, you're saved by his works, not yours. We're saved by the works of Jesus, not ours. And theologians make a distinction between the active obedience of Christ and the passive obedience of Christ. What is the passive obedience of Christ? It's when Jesus obeyed and submitted himself to the pain and the suffering of the cross. It's when he became obedient unto death, the Bible says, even the death of the cross. The passive obedience of Christ refers to his willingness to submit to the the pain inflicted upon him to bear the sins of the world and to die for sin. You remember in the Old Testament, when you obey the law, that brings a blessing. When you disobey the law, that brings a what? It brings a curse. Someone had to bear the curse. And in the passive obedience of Christ, Jesus bore the curse of God on the cross for us. What's the act of obedience of Christ? The act of obedience of Christ is when Jesus fulfilled all the law of God on our behalf. You see, not only did Jesus die for us, but he had to live for us. And during his earthly life, he obeyed the law perfectly. This is what qualifies him to be the lamb without blemish. This is what qualifies him for the song that we will sing throughout heaven. Worthy is the lamb that was slain because he fulfilled all of the Law's demands, and lived a perfect life, and he died for our sins with his passive obedience, but he lived for our righteousness with his active obedience. Let me just illustrate it to you like this. Just say you were in debt millions of dollars, had no way to get yourself out, and a rich man came along and said, you know what, I want to pay all of your debt. How many of you would let him do that? I would. Wouldn't that be a blessing? But now that only, that only causes you to come break even. You're not in the red anymore, but you're not in the black either. You need to have something to live on. So this rich man says, in addition to paying all of your debt, I will add to your account millions of dollars. Wow, what a blessing. That's wonderful. In a spiritual sense, that's exactly what Jesus did for you. You see, with his passive obedience, he paid your sin debt. And with his active obedience, he added to your account righteousness. And we're saved by righteousness, but it's not your righteousness. It's not my righteousness. It is the righteousness of Christ. And so when God looks upon us, he sees the righteousness of Christ when we put our faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross. And so Jesus was not a lawbreaker. He was the opposite. He fulfilled all of the law of God, and he did it for us. That was a bad decision that they made here. But here's another decision. Some say, well, he's a lawbreaker. 
And others said, well, he's a healer. Look in chapter 3, verse 7. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and from beyond Jordan, and they round about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they had heard what great things he, he did, came unto him. And so here, all these multitudes now, because in verse 8, they hear about the great things that Jesus did. This is before Facebook or Twitter. Word spread about what Jesus was doing. And they heard that, you know, they just got close because they just wanted to touch him. Because they heard that even his touch, look at verse 10. For he had healed many insomuch that they pressed upon him for to touch him. For as many as had plagues. And the word for plague there is a word that literally refers to a whip or a scourge. And it's used to speak about some kind of suffering, some kind of calamity, physical sickness or suffering. It's like being beaten with a whip. Maybe you feel like that this morning. You've had a lot of things happen, and you feel like you're beaten down, and you're suffering for so, some reason, some difficulty or calamity. That's how these people felt. And they knew that one touch from Jesus could change things. And so they pressed to get close, that they might touch the Lord Jesus, because they heard about his power. And indeed, he did have power. Because look what the Bible says, And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. Even demons, when they came into the presence of Christ, they were afraid and they cried out, You're the Son of God. And Jesus rebuked them. He doesn't, want, he doesn't need advertisement from the demonic world. He doesn't need any help from the world to advertise his name. So he rebukes them and he says, Be quiet. And so Jesus had the power to heal. He could heal any sickness, any trouble. He could cast out spirits. The people saw this and they came. They wanted a touch from Christ. And Je indeed, Jesus is the healer, friend. And he could heal you. Whatever your difficulty is, whatever your ailment, he can make it well. Just one touch from the Savior. But now, but the problem is, these people, all they wanted was to be healed. They didn't want to follow Christ. They didn't want to make an absolute commitment to him. They just wanted Jesus to help them. And after Jesus helped them, that was okay. Thank you, Jesus. And they went on with their life. They had no intention whatsoever of committing to who Jesus was. To the Lordship of Christ. They wanted all the benefits of salvation without the commitment. They wanted rewards without repentance. They wanted salvation without submission. They wanted the comfort without the commitment. They wanted the blessings without the blesser. Now, there are many people like that today. There's this bizarre doctrine out there that says that you can accept Jesus as your Savior. You don't have to accept him as your Lord. You can just have him as your Savior. You don't have to follow him. You don't have to be obedient to him. All you have to do is just accept him as your Savior. You can be saved from hell, and you can live whatever kind of life you want. I remember when I first got saved, I started witnessing to all my friends. And I remember on one occasion, I had a group of them around. It was about eight or ten of them. And I started sharing the gospel with them. And they were, they were in tune, man. They were listening. And I, and I remember I said, do you want to receive Jesus as your Savior? And one of them looked at me and said, well, can we, if we receive Jesus as our Savior, can we still do drugs? Can we still smoke pot after that? You know, they wanted forgiveness. They didn't want to turn from their sin. Had no idea of turning from their sin. They just wanted salvation from hell. I mean, I don't want to go to hell. I just want, I want to be able to live my, my own way here and have salvation from hell. But friends, salvation doesn't work that way. The call to salvation is a call to repent, to turn from sin, not hold on to it. Scripture teaches that real faith produces a changed life. What does the Bible say? If any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And so salvation includes a transformation of the inner person. Scripture teaches that Jesus is Lord of all. You don't come and barter with Jesus and say, well, Jesus, I'll take you as Savior, but I don't want you as my Lord. You don't have any way of bartering. You're a sinner. Do you understand that? He's the Savior. He's Lord of all. 
And you can't just come and say, these are my terms. You come on his terms or you don't come. And the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, literally Jesus as Lord. And so when we come to him, we come in submission, in surrender. And scripture teaches that behavior is an important test. If you're not willing to obey Jesus, that's a real sign that you're not really saved. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 3, Hereby do we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. You say you're a Christian and you have no desire to obey Jesus. What does John say about you? You're lying. You're a liar. You're not really a Christian. A true believer will obey the Lord Jesus. But now these people, they just wanted a healer. They didn't want a, 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 a Lord for their life. They just wanted Jesus to heal them. And so there were some, the decision they made, they said he's a lawbreaker. And the multitude said, well, he's a healer, a miracle worker. We could certainly use that. But here's the third decision I see in this chapter. He is our master. Look in chapter 3, look in verse 13. Notice Jesus' response. And he goeth up into a mountain. Jesus didn't stay around these multitudes. The Bible says he went up into a mountain. And he called unto him whom he would. And they came unto him. And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, that he might send them forth to preach. Our Lord's response was to go into a mountain alone, spend the night in prayer. This is according to Luke chapter 6 in the parallel passage. And when he came down the next morning, he selected 12 men. These 12 would be his disciples. They would be the ones who would follow Jesus all the days of their life. They made a commitment to Jesus to be, uh, that he would be their Lord and master. And so they would literally follow him. When Jesus said, follow me, there was a literal element to it. Because Jesus was a teacher that walked around. You know, he would go from village to village, and they would all walk with him. And he would teach them as they walked, and they would have to memorize what he said. And and they would have to serve him. And they would live with him, and they would learn from him. And Jesus calls these 12 to literally do that. They would be his disciples. It's from the Greek word, which means a learner. They were to learn all about the message of Jesus. And Jesus handpicked these men to follow him. And then he would send them out. You see, there are three commands. First, come. You come to Jesus. You repent of your sin. Then you learn. You learn all you can about Jesus and his message. And then what's the next thing? Go. You go. And that's what he's going to do. He's going to send them. It says here in verse 14, The word send there is apostello. It's where we get the word apostle, the sent ones. And so Jesus had these 12 disciples who became his 12 apostles that he would officially send. Now, the word apostle is used in two ways in the New Testament. First, it's an official sense. They're obeying the summons and the command of Jesus. And the Bible says there are certain qualifications to be an apostle, capital A. You had to see the risen Lord. And of course, we know there were 12 apostles and later there were added on some more apostles. I don't believe there are apostles today, capital A. I know sometimes people advertise themselves to be an apostle. And the first thing I want to ask them is, do you have the signs of an apostle? Because Jesus gave the apostles uh, authority to do miracles and to do great things. Now, there is a sense in which the word apostle is used in a broad sense. I say it like this, apostle with a small a. You're sent by Jesus. The truth of the matter is, whenever we go to share the gospel, whenever we go on a mission for the Lord Jesus Christ, we are an apostle, small a, we're being sent by him. And that certainly is something that the Lord wants us to do, is to represent him, to take the message of the word of God to others. And what Jesus is doing here is really, he's starting a new nation, or we could say a new kingdom. Israel had rejected him. They just said that he was a lawbreaker. You remember that when God started the nation of Israel, he started with 12 tribes. The number 12 is important. 12 tribes was the foundation of the nation of Israel. Now here Jesus starts a new spiritual nation with 12 disciples. They would be the core of his new kingdom, or we could also say the church. And they would be his disciples and his apostles, the foundation of the church, because they made Jesus Lord, and they determined to follow him. And so their their decision about Jesus is, 
Jesus, you are Lord, you are Master. We will give you our life. We will be a part of your church. Has that been your decision today, friend? Is Jesus your Lord, your Master? So some said he is a lawbreaker. Some said he's a healer. Here these disciples say he is our Master. Here's another decision I see in here. Some said he's beside himself. Look in chapter 3, look at verse 20. And the multitude coming together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said he is beside himself. Not everybody understood Jesus. There were some people that thought Jesus would, had taken leave of his senses. Some of his friends, they thought he was crazy. And by the way, history reveals that God's servants are usually misjudged by their contemporaries, misunderstood by their families. D.L. Moody was called Crazy Moody because he was so zealous for the gospel and the things of the Lord. Even the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, they said he's gone mad. And the truth of the matter is, friend, if you really do live for Jesus like we should, people will think we're crazy. And this is what they thought. They thought he's beside himself. And the Bible says in verse number 21 that they laid hold on him. This is the same verb used to speak of being arrested. That is, they wanted to take him into custody. They wanted to deliver him from some of the anger that he was generating through what he was saying. Look at verse 31. And there came then his brethren and his mother standing without and sent unto him, calling him. His family came. I mean, his brothers, half-brothers, we could say, sons of Mary and Joseph, they thought he was crazy. They didn't believe at this point in their life that he was the Son of God. And so they traveled 30 miles from Nazareth and pleaded with him to come home. What was Jesus' response to all of that? Well, Jesus basically, look in verse 32, what he said. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren seek thee with, seek, uh, without, seek for thee, excuse me. And he answered and say, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked around about him, which sat about him, and he said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. You see, their concern came from unbelief. The brothers of Jesus didn't really understand who he was. And so that's why they were thinking, this, he's got to be crazy. And the truth of the matter is, you really have only three options about Jesus. Either he is Lord, and by the way, C.S. Lewis said this, because a lot of people, they want to they give a nod to Jesus, and they want to say, oh, you know, he was a good moral teacher, he was a good man. But they don't want to say that he was Lord or God. But friend, you can't have it that way because if he's not God, if he's not Lord, he can't be a good moral teacher. Why? Because he presented himself as Lord and God. And if he presented himself as someone that he's not, that means he's a liar. It's like one man was witnessing to some Jehovah Witnesses and, and he said to them, do you worship Jesus? And they said, yes. And they said, he said, well, do you believe that Jesus is God? And they said, no. And he said, well, then why would you worship a liar? Because Jesus is either who he claimed to be, or he's a liar, or he's crazy. That's what C.S. Lewis said. He's either Lord, lunatic, or liar. You have to make your decision. Now, evidently, his family didn't believe he was Lord at this point. Now, of course, Mary did. Her concern was more about his protection from those that were angry, but his brothers didn't. And so they had to make a decision. And Jesus basically said, look, let me tell you who my... They said, well, your family is around. Jesus said, let me tell you who my real family is, those who are committed to doing the will of God. Jesus wasn't teaching us that we should ignore our family. He was just saying there is a bond in Christ that is, that is really closer and stronger than the bonds even with family when it comes to Jesus. You know what? You can be in Christ and feel closer to your brothers and sisters in Christ than you can your own family. Because there's that oneness, and we all have this one thing together that we want to do, and this is a sign of a true believer. We are committed to doing the will of God, to pleasing Jesus. Jesus said, these are my real family members. And so there were some there that said, he's beside himself. They didn't really understand who he was. But then there was a, another decision, the last one. Some said he's a lawbreaker, he's a healer, he's my master. Some said he's beside himself. 
Here's the last one. He's in league with Satan. This is the worst one. Look at verse 22. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of devils he casts out devils. And he called unto them, and he said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And friend, this is by far the worst decision that a person can come to about Jesus. They, the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they refused to accept his authority. They refused to accept that, who, that he was God. But yet he did all these supernatural miracles. So the question is, how can he do all these miracles if he's not God? And really the only option is this. You either, it's either by the power of God or by the power of Satan. And you know what they decided? He does what he does by the power of Satan. This is what I call the big lie. Notice it says in verse 22 that they came down from Jerusalem giving this lie that he's able to do all these things in the power of the devil. This was an orchestrated lie. This wasn't something that was said haphazardly. This was something that they got together about and they said, you know what, we've got to come up with a reason for this man who can do all these miracles. And someone said in that council, you know what, let's just say he does it by the power of Beelzebub. And by the way, who is Beelzebub? Well, in the Old Testament, the Canaanites had a god called Beelzebul, which means Lord of the High Places. And the Jews back then changed the L on the end of it to a B, which means Lord of the Manure Pile. It was kind of a derogatory way to refer to that god. And then later that title was used to refer to the devil himself. It was also... Uh, uh, means Lord of the Flies, because wherever there's a manure pile, there's flies. And so they attributed this name to the devil, and here they're attributing this name to Jesus. He's the prince of the devils. By the prince of the devils, he casts out devils. I can't imagine a more blasphemous thing to say about our Savior than this. But this was the decision they came to. And they said, let's just spread this lie. And did it work? Well, if you read throughout the rest of the Gospels, you have people saying, you have a devil. We believe you have a devil. This was the big lie. Now, Jesus' his answer was very simple. Look at verse 23. He said, how can Satan cast out Satan? This is illogical. Any kingdom, in verse 24, a kingdom that be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. It's totally illogical. And then Jesus gave the parable of the strong man, verse number 27, no man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. And so here's the picture of a, a, a castle, and there's an ancient warrior in charge of that castle, and if you want to take over that castle and take away the spoils, first of all, you have to go in and you have to bind the strong man. Now, Satan is the strong man, but Jesus is the stronger man that comes in and binds Satan and carries away the spoils. All that represents the spoils are souls that are in captivity to Satan. Every time someone gets saved, every, every time someone's delivered from sin, it's Jesus binding a strong man and carrying the captives away. That's the power of Christ. And what Jesus was basically saying is, all these miracles that you see, it should cause you to conclude that I have bound the strong man, and that I've come to set the captives free. But they didn't get that. In the parable. And so Jesus gives a warning in verse number 28. Look at verse 28. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. And Jesus said, you know, all manner of sins can be forgiven. The number of sins, someone says, is there a certain number of sins that you sin and where you cross the line and say, after this number of sins, God will no longer forgive me. No. Wherever sins abound, grace much more abounds. What about the degree of sin? You know, some of the most heinous sins can be forgiven of by God. But Jesus said there's one sin, however, that will not be forgiven. And what is it? It's blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. And that simply is this, 
that when you see the evidence of Jesus that he really is the Son of God, and you're unwilling to accept that evidence and bow to the Lordship of Christ and receive him for who he is, when you harden your heart to the point to where you're willing to say that all of what he does is, is in the power of Satan instead of God, that's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said that sin will not be forgiven. This is someone who hardens their heart to the extent that they will not submit to the Lordship of Christ. No matter all the evidences that have been presented to them, this is a person who basically says, Jesus, I see the evidence, but I'm not impressed. And they turn from the Lord. And Jesus said, this person will not be forgiven. They're in danger of eternal damnation. Now, the question always comes up, can a Christian commit this sin? No. If you're a Christian, that means you've bowed to the Lord Jesus Christ. You have received him as your Savior. But a lost person can certainly commit this sin. I remember when I was a younger pastor. Down in my first church I pastored, we had a, a godly evangelist come to our church named J. Harold Smith. You may have heard that name before. He preached all over the country. At that time, he was 80 years old. He just had this snow white hair. He looked like an Old Testament prophet to me. Here I was in my 20s. I had him into my church, this famous preacher. And I remember picking him up at the hotel that evening. He was going to come to our church and preach his famous sermon, God's Three Deadlines. This is, this is one of the great sermons uh, in church history, I think, that he preached. And I remember just driving him to the church. And already in the car, he said, Brother Jerry, you drive and I'll pray. And he started praying in the car. And by the time we got to church, he was already sweating like crazy because he'd been praying so intensely. And then when he got into the pulpit, he preached this famous sermon. And basically the whole theme of the sermon is God has three deadlines. And if you cross this deadline, God's done with you. Enough, God says. And the one deadline was sinning away the day of grace. He said, when you sin away the day of grace, God's done with you. And the other deadline was sin unto death. The Bible says, even for a Christian, there is a sin unto death that you can commit. And then the third one was blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And of course, that's based on this passage here, where a person denies the work of the Holy Spirit, denies the powerful work of God, and refuses it. And I remember him making this comment in the sermon. This is a man that had been all over, preached this sermon perhaps thousands of times all over the country and the world even. And he said this. He said that he personally knew of 21 people who had committed this sin and they crossed God's deadline. And he said within 24 hours of committing this sin, all of them died. You talk about scaring you. That is a scary thought. But friend, here's the point. Don't ever come to the place where you harden your heart against God to the point where God says to you, that's enough, enough. I've given you enough of my grace. I've given you enough time. And you still rejected me enough. That's what these people did. They made this decision a very bad decision. So the question is, how about you? What is your decision about Christ? Let me close with this. Dr. P.P. P. Joe was an Indian preacher, and in his book, Why God, he tells this story. He said about 150 years ago, from the writing of his book, there was a great revival in Wales, England. And as a result, many missionaries from Wales came to northeastern India, and they began to share the gospel. They went into a region that was comprised of hundreds of tribes, and these tribes were very primitive. They were very hostile very aggressive. Those missionaries were not welcome. But there was one missionary that was able to lead a man to Christ. And he led this man's wife to Christ and his two children. And this man was so contagious in his Christianity that once he got saved, he began to share the gospel. And many people in that tribe began to get saved. And the chief of the tribe got angry. And he called a meeting of the whole tribe and he put this man and his family in the center and he said to this man, I want you to renounce Jesus Christ. And the man said, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. And so the chief of the tribe 
had some men shoot arrows through his two children. And as his two children writhed on the ground, the chief said, I said, renounce Christ. I'm going to give you another chance. And this man said, though none go with me, I'm still going to follow Christ. No turning back. And then the chief had his wife killed before him. And he said, renounce Christ. And the man said, the cross before me and the world behind me. I'm not going to turn back. And then the chief had this man put to death. They all were killed. But the faith of this man so impacted that chief, he couldn't get away from it. And so he asked himself the question, how is it that a man who lived 2,000 years ago can have such an impact on a person as this man did? And he began to ask around, and he heard with the message that this man heard. And soon this chief got saved. And then all of the people in that tribe got saved. And they wrote down the words of the song that we now sing. I have decided to follow Jesus. That's where that song comes from. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Is that your prayer today, friend? Let's bow for prayer together. So, Father, I pray for those who are here today who perhaps have not yet made a decision about Christ, that today they would make a decision. That they would remember the words of Scripture, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. And Lord, may we be reminded that no decision is a decision. No decision is the decision, no. And so, Lord, I pray that you would use your word to penetrate into hearts. That if there's someone here that has not yet bowed to the Lordship of Christ, made him their Savior, Lord, that today would be that day of salvation. And with heads bowed, friend, I just want to ask you, would you be willing to make that decision right now? Right where you are? Let me just, again, ask this first. How many say, I've already made that decision. Jesus is my Lord. Fully and freely, I confess Him as Lord and Savior. Would you raise your hand and say, yes, that's my decision. I will follow Jesus. I will not turn back. No turning back for me. You may put your hands down. Now, friend, as I scanned the audience just a moment ago, some of you didn't raise your hand. So I want to ask you, what's your decision? What decision will you make about Him? And I would implore you, don't let another day go by. You don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. You don't know what a day is going to bring. Would you make that decision today to trust Jesus? Would you pray this prayer and mean it? Jesus, I believe you're the Savior and Lord. I turn from my sin. I turn to you today. Come into my heart. Save me, Lord Jesus. Make me your child. And friend, if you pray that, he, he will save you. Would you make that decision today? Would you, would you say, preacher, pray for me. I'm deciding right now to follow Christ. Right now, I'm making my decision for him. Anyone here? Anyone here? I don't want to embarrass you, friend, but I want to pray for you. Anyone here today? Father, bless this word to hearing hearts. Use it for your glory, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right.